Howdy, folks. Welcome to Decolonizing Economics, the third annual post-capitalism uh, conference. I'm going to take a moment to acknowledge that this is, in fact, the third post-capitalism conference. Uh, the first two were just called the post-capitalism conference. Kali Akuno was one of the keynotes. Uh, Rick was at the second uh, one. Uh, but we, I, I really want to underscore that this year, it is not only participation with the local Wiat tribe, but is literally co-anchored by the Wiat tribe. When I acknowledge that Rick Wolf had Michelle Vassell, the tribal administrator, and myself on to Democracy at Work. Um, and I'm, I'm saying this to say the Wiat tribe are not just participating, but are literally co-anchoring it. Uh, we went to the tribe and uh, to the tribal council, their government, and made a request uh, that they co-anchor a post-capitalism conference. Uh, Ted Hernandez, the tribal uh, chair, uh, made the motion. It was unanimously adopted. Uh, and then through the course of that work, we renamed it Decolonizing Economics, colon, the third annual post-capitalism conference. And I say that because I want to underscore we're not only on we are ancestral territory, or I am and uh, Cal Poly University is, but just let that wash over you for a moment that a government says, absolutely, we want to co-anchor something called the post-capitalism conference. The second thing I want to do uh, is to really introduce uh, this panel. Uh, I'll, uh, and I will frame the panel and then one by one introduce uh, our panelists and have them answer this question. This panel is really literally called, What is to be done? And of course, that is a reference to a political pamphlet uh, written at the turn of century by Vladimir Lenin. Uh, the, the subtitle was Burning Questions of Our Movement. Uh, and in that pamphlet, Lenin literally outlined a skeletal plan for going beyond fighting for like individual battles over wages and working hours and so forth, and towards a plan to restructure all of society. And so as we are in this historic moment, a true conjuncture with a full-blown ecological collapse, it's not coming, it's here and beginning and quickening. We're watching late stage capitalism morph into political economy known as fascism. And literally we're seeing a fascist social movement, not only in this country, but throughout the world. We're bringing together four movement leaders to ask that question to them what is to be done. The first uh, speaker will be Yvonne Yen Lu. Uh, I know her through her uh, work through the Solidarity Economy Movement. She's also the principal lead for a municipalism learning series. I hope she'll talk about that. So let's just turn it right over to Yvonne. Yvonne, what is to be done? Thanks, David. Um, so I have a presentation. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can folks see that? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so my name is Yvonne, my pronouns are she, her. I'm based in Los Angeles or also Tongva land. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what this, uh, elaborate a little bit more on what I perceive this moment to be, one, um, of, a, one of municipalism and in answer to the question of what is to be done, I think we need to build strong municipalities, but I'll talk more about what that means. Um, so first, what is municipalism? So um, actually, before I go ahead, what, what do folks think? I, I know we have, is it too much to ask folks to participate in chat? Would that flood the chat? It will not, we, we encourage that. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, yeah, so I'm curious, what do folks think municipalism is? Put your thoughts in the chat and, I can read some out loud. So what is municipalism? Localized governance, says Lizzie. Home rule, um, local governance, local control, local community organizing. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
economic, ecologically sustainable cities governed by direct democracy, polis, that's actually the name of a platform <laughs> as well, people. <laughs> um, great, so yeah, I think municipalism and uh, Sid says building local anti-capitalist and sustainable experiments. Um, so I think, you know, municipalism is a really broad term. It can mean a lot of different things, but I think, yeah, so organizing the economy around cities. I think there are three characteristics that um, I think are common to municipalism. The first is um, that it be directly democratic, that it be participatory. I think the, the part of it being at the scale of a city or a town or a village is that you can participate you know, in a way that in a larger geographic scale, you can't. Secondly, the way that it's been practiced, especially more recently, is that it's feminist. So there's a real attention to um, the, the value of care, labor, um, of social reproduction, and also um, the participation and um, of, of women and mothers. Um, and that also it's anti-capitalist. So it's about creating a new sort of local economy um, that is separate from the dominant economic system that we live in. Um, so I think, you know, one of the sort of major thinkers um, of municipalism um, or a variant libertarian municipalism was Murray Bookchin. So, you know, he was a, he was a, a communist that, you know, later moved to from New York who later moved to Vermont um, and talked about the social conditions that led to the that lead to the ecological crisis but he also talked about how um, you know the, you know when we take over control of our municipalities we can confederate them together um, and that in and of itself can be a way to challenge the um, authority of the state um, when we build these confederations. Um, and so there's a really great um, article that um, a, a municipalist in, the, in England, Matthew Thompson wrote, where he just sort of creates three typologies for municipalism. The first being platform municipalism, which I think Barcelona, Spain is a good example of. Um, the second is autonomous municipalism. Um, which, you know, Jackson, we have our comrade here, Kali, from there um, um, is an example of in Rojava. And then managed municipalism, which I think folks like the Democracy Collaborative um, are really involved in establishing examples like in Cleveland, the Evergreen Cooperative and the Preston model. Um, but, you know, I think, I think, you know, in, in all of these three cases, I think in two platform and autonomous municipalism, there's definitely an emphasis on um, organizing from the bottom up. Where I was, whereas I would say that managed municipalism is more sort of technocrats kind of implementing a, an ecosystem of different worker cooperatives. Um, but each of them are, you know, very specifically democratic, feminist, and also anti-capitalist. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the context that we're organizing here in Los Angeles, where I'm based in Tongva land, because I think it's important that I'm not just sort of talking. I mean, I, I think it's great to have ideas, but I also have a political project that I'm working on um, and I'm rooted in place because I think that's that's an important thing. So, you know, Los Angeles is a city um, of almost 400, 4 million people. We have 400 plus neighborhoods. Most of us are tenants. Um, almost half of us are Latinx. About a quarter of us live in poverty. And based on the last count, 60, more than 66,000 of us are unhoused. And I think that's an undercount. I think more folks are gonna be joining those ranks, unfortunately, especially with the sunset of the um, eviction moratorium. Um, Mary and I can add the link to the Matthew Thompson article shortly. Um, maybe when I'm done with my presentation. You're welcome. Um, so our hypothesis in Los Angeles is that we have the social conditions that are ripe for a municipalist movement. So um, a movement that will stitch together all the autonomous um, institutions and organizations and grassroots groups 
that are working across the city um, and to create a citywide people's platform similar to what Barcelona and Camus has done in 2015. So they had a version of their Occupy movement, the Indignados, um, and they also had um, an anti-eviction movement that started after the Great Recession. All of those different movement forces came together and built a group called Barcelona in Common in Camus and created a, a, a citywide people's platform to represent the demands of the people and to really take the city back from neoliberal capitalism. So we think uh, that's our hypothesis. Ours is a two-year project. We have an expiration date in case our you know, um, ideas don't work out. So, um, you know, what are our assumptions that are guiding our work? The first is that movements go through cycles. So um, I think, you know, the thing here is that usually, typically there's a trigger event that causes mass participation in a social movement. And that's usually followed by a period of disillusionment and a lower period of um, sort of um, movement activity. Um, and I think this is important for us to see, you know, I think there's a lot of different cycles that are happening across the movement. We also recognize that this is a low moment in general, but I think we're starting to pick up with activities um, across different neighborhoods in Los Angeles. So we want to be ready for when the next trigger event happens. When is the next uprising going to happen? We want to build the infrastructure in place to be able to, to harness that energy. Um, our second our second assumption is the three and a half percent rule. So this was based on work by um, a sociologist, Erica Chenoweth, with a nonviolent civil disobedience activist, Maria Stefan. Their actual um, intention behind their research was initially to look at um, whether you know nonviolent civil disobedience was um, efficacious in terms of resulting in social change. One byproduct of their research, they put together a database of different social movements over time. It, would they, they also measured participation and they found that in order to have serious political change, you need to have three and a half percent of the population engaged actively in that movement. Um, so it's not 90%, it's not even 51%, but it's three and a half percent. So for us in a city of 4 million people, that's 150,000 or 400 people in each of our neighborhoods. Um, and our third assumption is that people are already organized into networks. So whether that's through neighborhood institutions like the church or food pantries, community fridges, mutual aid networks, um, people are already organized. And the way that movements have been evolving is that we're moving from, you know, sort of more centralized structures into decentralized and even distributed structures as well. So part of what our task is, is to map out those networks within the city and to build connect connections to those nodes. And we see ourselves as a network of self-organized movements. Um, so our timeline, we've studied the timeline of Barcelona and Camus, and they went through a similar, they went through a two-year process to create their people's platform. So ours is um, also a two-year timeline process. We're going to launch on May Day. Um, so we also are launching, um, we're launching in a big party and a big social gathering because we think those types of social relationships are really important in a movement but we're also launching the first opening panel of our municipalism learning series because we want to learn from other examples of fellow municipalists. So we have a panel including um, our comrade Kali um, here, as well as Ruthie Gilmore, um, Ananya Roy and Malik Simone. Um, and then um, we are going to spend the rest of this year doing mapping of networks throughout Los Angeles. So um, identifying the, the different nodes within across the 400 neighborhoods in our city and then launch neighborhood assemblies in the next year and cohere around a people's platform that is citywide. Um, so I, this is an invitation, you know, I think this is my response to what is to be done. I think we need to create municipalist projects. We need to take back our city 
in a way that's directly democratic, feminist, and anti-capitalist. And we need to confederate all of our sort of municipalist experiments together. And this is an invitation to come and learn with us. We are building a project here in Los Angeles. Come and, you know, um, and, and explore, you know, what this could mean as a movement. Um, and, uh, and if you are in Los Angeles, we invite you to join us. I said that we have a party. So we have music, we'll have food. <laughs> so um, I think it'll be, it'll be really fun and interesting. Um, so that's my presentation. And this is just information about how to, how to reach us. And I, I will put the link into the Matthew Thompson article shortly. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, and if you are in Jarajiji or Gudini, which is Eureka Arcata, or anywhere along Ouija, the Humboldt Bay, I want to invite you to a watch party at Eureka Books uh, in Old Town Eureka. Uh, our good friend Solomon Everta, who just bought that uh, institution right across the street from the Wiat Cultural Center, we're going to be hosting a watch party. Uh, so, uh, we haven't pulled off the music, uh, but we will be doing a watch party uh, and we want to invite you uh, there as well. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, really needs no introduction, but I'm going to give one because it's kind of uh, I'm kind of fanboying over the fact that we have Richard Wolf with us. Uh, for this group, I don't think Rick Wolf needs any introduction. He's probably the most famous socialist uh, in the United States today. Um, he's not only an economics professor, but he really is in large part responsible for popularizing the idea of socialism, uh, the application of not dogmatic Marxism, but a Marxian approach uh, to dialectic materialism. Uh, he is the co-founder of Democracy at Work. He hosts the Economic Update with Rick Wolf. He was with us last year. He's with us here again. Rick Wolf, I pose to you, what is to be done? Well, let me thank you all. I know <clears throat> from my own experience how much work goes into making events like this happen uh, and how many people are not uh, here to take a bow when they deserve one. So let me just thank all of the people uh, here and not here uh, who help make these kinds of events happen. They're crucial, these getting together, talking, listening to each other. Uh, there is nothing more important uh, at this time. And, and I agree that we are at a time where activity is picking up. Uh, the whole city of New York City, I'm sitting in Manhattan as I speak to you, uh, is still reverberating with the echoes of what Chris Smalls and his associates were able to do on Staten Island at that Amazon warehouse, uh, workers across this city who barely know anything about it have heard something. And it's, it's a kind of wildfire that is very, very uh, symptomatic of where we are. Uh, when I thought about what I might offer, I tried to come up with something that touched the decolonizing thematic that, that governs what you do uh, the economics uh, that I have something to say about, the what is to be done question, and then the we are tribe, uh, the ability of people like David and others to build bridges with that tribe and to work together. That's kind of an inspiration all over the place, a little bit like what Chris Smalls and his folks did at Staten Island. So uh, here's what I came up with. And I, I ask your indulgence. I am an economics professor uh, that does hobble me in all kinds of ways. And, and here's going to be another one, but maybe it's useful. Um, we need to decolonize, not only in terms of all the settler economies and colonialisms of the last umpteen centuries. Uh, you all know that we are doing that. But we also need to decolonize our minds because they too have been colonized. Our ways of thinking about everything, especially economics, has been colonized by a, a tradition of thought that is much more deeply lodged in the minds of people like us than most of us are most of the time 
willing to acknowledge or admit. Uh, I suffer from it because I'm a product of America's elite institutions. They taught me the economics uh, in a way that I know. I've been in revolt against them ever since I've been a student, but I'm not naive and I know that they got through to me in ways I still have to discover. So I wanna to talk to you briefly about that because one of the things that must be done is to break the hold of the colonialism of our thinking. And in economics, it works like this. The entirety of the profession, not just in this country, but in most of the rest of the world, makes an assumption most of the time, there are a few exceptions, but not many, makes an assumption that capitalism as a system is somehow intrinsically necessary, that it's natural, that it, it's like rain, and it would make no more sense to shake your fist at the sky because it's dumping water on your picnic uh, than it would be to shake your fist at capitalism because really that's the way it always was, it always will be, it is natural, it is all encompassing. And what do I mean by that? Well, this may surprise you. I don't mean the way capitalism is usually referred to. If you pick up the New York Times or any other publication, you'll see capitalism equated to things like the market or the free market or private enterprise or free enterprise or private property. I want you to think for a minute with me that those definitions of what capitalism is, and therefore what we anti-capitalists are, what we prefer is mistaken. It is a distraction from what capitalism is. And indeed all those definitions have the function of focusing us somewhere where we oughtn't to be focused. When I teach my courses, I remind students who mostly know it, that markets are in no way unique to capitalism. Half of the major cities of the South, if you visit them, you will discover that downtown somewhere in a Southern city is the old slave market. Remember in slavery, there was a market, a market in people. There's nothing unique to capitalism about having markets. The slaves who were themselves objects of sale helped to produce cotton, which was another marketable commodity. In other words, markets are not unique to capitalism, nor are private and free enterprises, nor is private property. So what exactly then is capitalism? Well, it's the thing we don't talk about. It's the common assumption as if it had to be. And here it is that the only way to organize the production of goods and services is to have a relatively small number of people making the decisions what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the output. Those people are called businessmen and women or owners or major shareholders or boards of directors. We have a variety of institutional variations, but it's always a tiny group of people who then make the decisions with which a vast majority of the people are required to live. That organization into employer-employee, that is what I would urge us all to think about because it reveals so much. Number one, across the curriculums, no one ever questions that. We are taught in the university, and I've taught in half a dozen universities, I teach in one now. We are taught in the universities and all my colleagues with li literally a handful of exceptions, teach this as if this is 
the only way to understand what production in any society ever was. A tiny group of masters and a lot of slaves, a tiny group of lords and a lot of serfs, a tiny group of employers and a lot of employees. Capitalism came into being in Europe swearing that it would bring life liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy by overthrowing feudalism. It failed. It didn't overthrow any of it. It reproduced it. Why? Because of its assumption, unexamined, that this is the way you have to organize society. We have to break the hold that this notion of intrinsic necessity for the inequality that organizes production in capitalism, that defines capitalism. The great revolutions like Lenin's that David quoted, they wanted, they did, they wanted to overcome what had gone before. They were anti-capitalist and they instituted all kinds of interesting institutions, but you know what they didn't change? the organization of production into a small number of people, now state officials, and a large number of people over whom the state officials exercised the decisions what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the product. The frustration of what uh, capitalism promised and never delivered has been reproduced because the shift towards socialism stopped at the midpoint of state capitalism. We have to learn that. And ironically, but also beautifully, it is people who lived in other ways. I know nothing about the We Are tribe, but I do know enough about a whole host of native indigenous people. They didn't organize production that way. And the wisdom of having not done it that's a wisdom that capitalism lost along the way, and feudalism and slavery lost along the way. You know, much of the fight against slavery was driven by people who wanted to have slaves live in a better condition. They should be better fed. They should be better clothed. They should be allowed to be free. They should be allowed to have families. Until some group came along and said, stop. The issue isn't making the slave better off. The issue is slavery. Why is one person? A... The issue is not higher wages or better working conditions. The issue is what in the world is going on that a tiny group of people can operate a, a social production system, take the bulk of the wealth that's produced for themselves and leave everybody scrambling. The root cause of it is this assumption unexamined that the employer-employee relationship is absolute, natural, and necessary. It isn't any of those. An honest education system, which we can bring about if we break the hold of this way of thinking, would have begun in elementary school teaching young kids and in university even more to think about fundamental alternative ways of organizing something as fundamental as producing and distributing goods and services. It's irrational to not do that. And we live in a society that's fundamentally irrational in the narrowness of its unexamined assumptions. Breaking free which maybe indigenous tribal groupings can help us out of their own history to rediscover would be a way of breaking a hold that has done as much as anything to hold back human progress. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Wolf. Uh, and I hope folks can see why Professor Wolf is one of America's most famous socialists. Uh, our next speaker uh, into the conversation is Jessica Alvarez Parfray. Uh, I know Jessica 
uh, not only as a, a friend, but as somebody who practices radical collaboration and community co-creation. Uh, she is the new executive director of Transition US. I am so very excited to welcome Jess into this conversation and to ask her that question. Jess, what is to be done? Um. Such a big question. Um, and before I respond, I want to acknowledge that I am calling in from ancestral Pomo territory up here in Northern California. I'm surrounded by redwoods. It's been a rainy day. And I've really just been soaking in all of the, the information and also the recognition of all of the beautiful networks and mosaics of relationship that are represented just here on this call. Um, so on that question of what is to be done, I think there's a lot of things that need to be done. And that's what I spend a good amount of my time kind of sitting with and grappling with. As a person with a limited capacity and infinite possibility before us, like what can I most effectively do? And I think Yvonne, you mentioned the importance of having a place-based relationship to this work. And this is something that I've really been moving through in a, in a really profound way. And I won't get into my whole life story, but I think in order to answer this question, I've been like, I probably have to tell you my whole life story. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, in terms of what is to be done, I'm really inspired, I'm enlivened, I'm here in solidarity for the type of work that I see David involved in. Yvonne recently connected through um, our mutual involvement in the NEC Regional Organizing Working Group. Dr. Richard Wolf, like your voice has been such an inspiration. I, re I recall sitting in a college econ course and just losing my mind. I'm reading decolonial um, kind of theory and prax and like engaging with praxis. And then I'm sitting in a college econ course and it's mind you meant to be an environmentally conscious envi uh, econ offering. And one of the activities that we had as students was to think about the tragedy of the commons. And so I went to UC Santa Barbara, um, I'm forgetting his name, but he was a professor there and he, Gerard, what's his name? Anyone, if, if folks know his name, he's the one who pro, um, proliferated this idea of the tragedy of the commons. And it was largely based off of a somewhat racist thought experiment. Garrett Hardin, that's who it is, yeah, yes. Yeah. So basically the activity in our class was for our professor to throw a bunch of paper clips on the floor and say, you're, fo you're hunters, buffalo hunters. Now get the most buffalo. And the intention was to show that we would all scramble, that we would all compete against each other to rustle up the most buffalo. And I was just sitting there like, this is so insulting and so indicative of the issue here. And I again, Dr. Wolf, you were mentioning that we are literally unable to see beyond the confines that this capitalist system has kind of put on us, these blinders where we only see one particular kind of world progression as our destiny. And it comes at the cost and a violent cost. It is intentionally maintained for us to not acknowledge other world, other ways of being and doing in the world. So in terms of what must be done, there are lots of things to be done, but we also need to ask ourselves the question, who are we going to become in the process? And so I think about with the work around radical municipalism, all of these experiments in new kinds of democratic processes, de decentralized, distributed, like we are so new at this. And I think in terms of the climate crisis, if we're gonna bring that into the conversation, um, we are unprepared for kind of the massive complexity of all of these different relationships that we're having to navigate, especially since a very small portion of the population, as was already mentioned, has been in charge of wiring in the assumptions, designing the architecture, creating different methods in which to channel and predict outcomes. And I also think about that in terms of our relationship to our technologies. We're using a platform right now, Zoom. A lot of us engage in, on social media to spread the messages that we're you know, involved in with our different work and we're being extracted from every day that we're using these tools. So I'm really thinking about in terms of this decolonization work, we have to remember first and foremost, it's about also protecting tribal sovereignty and indigenous sovereignty on this land. There are assaults daily um, attacking that and I think 
any time that we can do our best as guests on, on, on land, on native land, all of us are on native land, to do our due diligence in terms of organizing around things like honor taxes, land back efforts. Um, I myself and my, my partner have recently um, come into relationship with 44 acres of land in San Diego. And so that feels very complex for me because I'm engaging in a settler colonial kind of paradigm of purchasing land that's been parceled off. Um, it's private property in one way of thinking. And then in the other, it's like, this land is helping me become who I need to be in this world. And at the same time, that speaks to a level of responsibility that we have not only to the land, but to the people who, who have been there since time immemorial and whose resilience, whose innovation is of so much inspiration to me. I've been reading this amazing book and I highly recommend folks like take a specific look at your region, your bio region, if you will, your state, if you wanna look at that scale and recognize the indigenous um, struggle the history of that land and that place that you call home. You can get this wide overview that a lot of us got in elementary school or middle school, you're missing the story. And this, this particular offering is native California history and it centers those experiences, those perspectives. It's not coming from a Western worldview where you're adding on some cultural spice. Uh, which is how we typically experience these. So making sure that we're working with indigenous leaders, we're actively integrating their requests, their stories, stepping up in solidarity, like all of the beautiful work that I am so appreciative of. Um, I just wanna see it spread and continue to grow. Being mindful that we have to be respectful of the layers of history of relationship whenever we move through this work. It can be really easy to get caught up here in terms of the theoretical and the abstract. So one thing I wanna plug that we're working on within Transition US is our three-year campaign. We're calling it Regeneration Nation. So it's taking into account the colonial harms, the histories, the structural inequities that we're dealing with right now, and also all of the beautiful promise and growth around a regenerative kind of design and way of interacting with land and with one another. We want to be able to take kind of a cultural snapshot of the world that is growing that is possible. And we have um, a fall 2022 week of action plan kicking off on Indigenous Peoples Day. So the intention is to celebrate the stories of resilience, of struggle, of innovation, of collaboration. Again, this conference is modeled on a beautiful way of having consent, camaraderie and collaboration in your work when you're in, you know, working in solidarity with indigenous communities, this is so essential. So anyway, within Regeneration Nation, we want to highlight all of the beautiful work, the stories and spread the messages, the models, the visions that we need to keep and sustain us in this work because there's a lot to do. So that's my final word on that question, David. Thank you, Jessica. I just love you so very much. I'm so grateful that you're my friend, my mentor, uh, my colleague. Uh, and I feel the same exact way about the final speaker on this panel. Uh, Kali Akuno, likewise, probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway because it is my deep honor to bring my friend and comrade into this conversation. You know, I, I like, Kali Akuno's uh, movement bio can be seen in lots of places, but I'm going to tell you this. I met Kali about 20 years ago. Uh, he was with the, U I think he was at the time with the U.S. Human Rights Network. I then saw him spring into action during Katrina. I worked very closely with him at the U.S. Social Forum uh, National Planning Committee and that process of bringing people together. He, I then tracked his work at Cooperation Jackson, which I believe is arguably the most advanced version of, of a municipalist approach happening anywhere in the United States with all its flaws, all its successes. And I have rarely seen someone embrace uh, Amical Cabral's call to mask no difficulties, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. Kali Akuno, I pose the question to you, what is to be done? Okay, well, <clears throat> good, um, good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Uh, and good afternoon and good evening to folks who may be checking in anywhere. Um, just repeat 
Uh, my name is Kali Akuno. I use he, him, or anything said with love and respect in terms of uh, pronouns. Um, uh, I am in uh, Medgar Eversville, and I want all of you to start referring to that because I think we're going to start making uh, person conversations this week, making a real change to get rid of uh, this ugly association uh, with Andrew Jackson that the city that I am currently residing is named after. Um, and Andrew Jackson, for those of you who don't know, um, in many respects was the, the, the model of kind of a fascistic dictator. Uh, um, you know, guys under Yelman Farmer populism uh, of the time um, and it committed some of the worst atrocities, um, documented atrocities, because there's tons that, that weren't documented or, or insufficiently documented uh, all over, you know, every square inch of this land. Uh, but some of the worst uh, in terms of uh, his uh, treatment of uh, enslaved Africans uh, and his genocidal assaults against uh, indigenous people, right? But particularly in the Southwestern portion of what is now called the United States, um, you know, leading up to the infamous uh, Trail of Tears. Um, and keep in mind, this was, he was the model uh, that one Donald uh, Trump had. Um, and uh, I remember when Donald Trump, I mean, this was something we kind of already knew, but when Donald Trump put his picture in the Oval Office as like the person who was emulated, that should have told us all we really needed to know about what was coming down and, and what perspective uh, from which by which he was going to try to govern and rule and, and uh, the forces that are allied with him, uh, what their aim and perspective is. So uh, I'm starting with that. Um, just to say that part of this question, you know, this question is context by the time that we are in. And there's a couple of critical conjunctures that we are at, right? There's, there's the advance of right-wing reactionary forces, not only here in the United States, but globally, um, who are becoming more united, becoming more consolidated. Um, they have an international, in effect, uh, now, Capitol always had one, so let's, let's make that clear. But they they are definitely building a, a clear right wing consolidated block. Um, and where's ours? Right. That's the that's part of the question that we have to ask and answer ourselves. I firmly believe in what Yvonne you know laid out about us federating uh, our projects. Like that is a fundamental prerequisite for the age. That I'm just taking, you know, that that old narrative of you pl plant your flag, which is a bunch of colonial shit. But you know, planting you plant your flag uh, on that particular piece of what we firmly need to do uh, in regards to to our, our projects. And I'm here to to argue, comrades, that I think if we step back and we look at uh, what we are concretely doing in a couple of of, of key areas. Uh, there are more co-ops, for instance, being built, you know, throughout the United States, and I think in any period, probably since the 1930s. Um, there's more organizing, you know, in the in the trade union section, and more militancy, and more consciousness, uh, more union driving efforts than there've been probably since the 1970s. Um, there's been a massive explosion of mutual aid work, particularly since the pandemic. Some of it off, some of it on. Uh, but I think the need in many of our communities that we have to, you know, uh, 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 we are being forced and we have to kind of rely on each other and our social networks on a communal basis is becoming much more clear and apparent and people are moving from what I can see, you know, it's, it's sporadic, but people are moving in that direction on a mass level, right? We are, millions of people are now engaged in these type of activities. Similar to uh, kind of the food, I wouldn't call them all food sovereignty work, but definitely food justice work, right? There are uh, uh, efforts of folks uh, either trying to return back to the land in terms of you know, farming all throughout the country. Uh, and there are uh, urban farms, uh, urban farming projects uh, that have been sprouting up over the last like 20 to 25 years all over. Uh, and then there's another kind of phenomenon, a little bit more tricky, but one uh, 
uh, that we need to tap into, uh, uh, I think, for some of our own strategic strategic reasonings uh, uh, as oppressed people and as working class people. Uh, and that is kind of this fab maker, digital fabrication space, basically the kind of low scale uh, manufacturing. And the key to that particular piece, at least how I argue and frame uh, uh, for it, not to be kind of, you know, uh, uh, overindulgent uh, or excessive about uh, industrial production because it's done some wonders, but it's also done a tremendous amount of damage and how it's been rolled out, who owns and controls it to Mother Earth itself, right? It's bringing us to the brink. And that's the other piece that I think is underscoring this. We are at a critical juncture where ecological collapse is happening rapidly all around us. And we have to get ourselves organized for this. And I think these core pieces of what I just framed, but we call this the build and fight formula, right? And this are, these are things that people are objectively doing already. The issue and the challenge that we have is how do we combine this? And then how do we organically construct a political program around it that enables us to build collective power and capacity? That is the challenge, right? Because sometimes I think we think, well, there's not enough of this or there's not enough of that or there's not enough work going on. I've argued like, no, there's tons of stuff going on. We're just not connected, right? Uh, uh, and we have to learn the broad democratic practice of st struggling with each other, coming to some conclusions with each other, and then working with each other where there's variance, where there's difference, because we don't have to be monolithic in our approach. It does not have to be one line in our orientation. Like, I think we know enough about some of the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of that orientation that we're not, we should not repeat some of the errors of the 20th century in that particular regard. But the deeper level of struggling for democracy, and I mean democracy with the, with the, the small d, right, in the practice, like that is a critical feature of what has to be done and us learning how to do it in this day and time. And then really rooting that, I think, in the, in the, in, in our, con in the U.S. context, it's critical that we build these, these, what you want to call them, uh, nodes or liberated zones or municipal projects. We, we have to do that. That's an essential thing that we have to do to, to meet all these different challenges, the challenge of the right, uh, the, the economic uh, crisis, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'd love to hear, you know, Rick's uh, uh, take on this a little bit more, you know, but I don't think this inflation crisis is going anywhere, just given some of the shifts that happened uh, uh, in production overall that have occurred definitely since uh, 2008, but it's definitely been accelerated, I think, by the pandemic and not even more so by this inter-imperialist conflict, which is taking place uh, uh, in the Ukraine and elsewhere. That's not the only place that this has been going on. Uh, we shouldn't forget that Yemen and Syria, those places have also been elements of, of inter-imperialist rivalry and conflict playing out at, at, at uh, uh, oppressed people's expense uh, um, you know, for the, the aggregation of empires, right? So uh, we need to figure this out, but I think the core elements of what we need to do are there. That is my argument. I think our challenge is how do we put it together? So that's a piece that I'm putting forward uh, to all of us that we have to figure out uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, city by city, uh, and then federate up and build up on, on a national and international level. So I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thank you all for. And now folks, what I'm going to do is to invite our panelists to all come off mute uh, and I know it's a little tricky because we're all on video and so forth, but to literally engage in a conversation together. I've been capturing a couple of uh, comments I'll, uh, and questions. I encourage participants to, to keep the, the, your questions or comments coming, but I'm gonna literally invite the participants amongst yourselves as the thought leaders that you are, uh, what did you hear from one another that either sparked a curiosity or, or that you felt like you wanted to uh, to engage with. And I'll point out, Kali already sort of lifted you up, uh, Rick, whenever he was wondering about the inflation uh, issue. So I'm going to stop talking and I, I, I facilitate only if I need to, but I'm going to really encourage the four of you uh, to engage a conversation that the rest of us can watch. Well, maybe I can start off. One of the things I found remarkable is literally the tableau of all four. Uh, in other words, th there's a tone of hope, a tone of possibility. 
And I find that very remarkable because it is a downtime in much of the country. An awful lot of people are very down. And if that's true, as I believe it is, and if we just gathered a few people here who are kind of um, looking forward, seeing the problem, but you know, seeing the problem means you're on the steps to try to figure out how to solve it. There's, I feel good about that. I know we have enormous problems. I, I get that. I feel really good about it. The other thing I wanted to answer because it, of Kali's bringing it up, the inflation is a way for us, and there are many topics, but it is a way for us, I think, if we, if we talk to each other, to develop a strategy that will enable us to reach large numbers of people. The inflation is an assault by one part of the community against another. It has to be understood as that. Everything is being done by the mass media not to present it in that way, to present it as some uh, bad thing that's descending us, you know, like a bad storm or or a piece of bad luck or something like that. Here's a very simple way to get it. Prices are set in a capitalist system by a particular group of people. It's called the employer. If you've ever been an employee, you will have noticed that setting the price of whatever it is you help to produce is not among your obligations or responsibilities. You have nothing to say about it. Prices are said, set by employers, not by employees. Employers are 1% of the population. Employees are the rest of us. The employees pay the prices, the employers set them. That's all you need to know to understand what this is about. This is about shifting wealth and income because the American empire is shrinking and declining and has been already for a while and is continuing, it becomes more desperate for those at the top to hold on and to shift the burden of a declining empire on everybody else as fast as they can. Inflation is a way to do that. When you see, as they have this week, that inflation is listed as eight and a half percent and wages are going up on average, maybe in the neighborhood of 5%, that's it. You don't need all that much more information. There it is. It means that a worker who gets a 5% increase, and most workers don't, that person who gets a 5% increase is, is still suffering a decline in their standard of living because the prices are going up by eight and a half percent. I mean, this is not rocket science. This is an economy that has just imposed on its working class the worst public health disaster in the history of the country, the second worst economic crash after the Great Depression. That's in the years 2020 and 2021. And now says to the working class, we're gonna smack you in the face with an inflation. And if I understand my classmate in graduate school, Janet Yellen, uh, telling us they're gonna raise interest rates, we're gonna have a recession by the end of this year or early next year. It's a three year trifecta of class struggle. There's no other way to describe it. And I think we could go to the American people with something like that. And that might help build the unification that all of us have been talking about. Kali, you are muted. It looked like you may have been speaking. No, I was saying uh, where you want to build on for that. I, I got nothing but 100% unity with that, with that breakdown. Yeah. Yvonne and Jess, I'm going to invite you to actually come off mute. And again, so that I don't have to facilitate, I've got questions here, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, I'm, I'm actually just really thinking about um, you know, the prompt. So what is to be done? Um, 
And I actually, I had never read the, the pamphlet by Lenin. And so I actually, you know, I'm like, I'm going to do my homework and engage with this. And I'm curious, David, because this was selected as the prompt and kind of helping to ground the conversation, was there any particular nugget of wisdom from that offering that you have resonated with and that you wanted to see kind of mentioned? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, I th first, uh, like, can I just like, I'm beaming, like the fact that you went and read that pamphlet, because, uh, like as preparing for this just fills me with such happiness and joy. Uh, and the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, there was a reason for that, and Rick touched on it in his opening remarks. And I want to say it again. Remember that what is to be done, burning questions for our movement, uh, it was helpful to me at the very beginning, but the whole point that Lennon was saying was, look, all of these fights and struggles that are erupting all over the globe uh, uh, you know, were fights against the worst oppressions of the industrial era, the worst oppressions of capitalism. And he said that the call that he made, what is to be done was, we have to restructure society, he said, right? And, and, and then, you know, and I, we can go through the Bolsheviks and blah, blah, blah. But, but the point is, at the core, that pamphlet was a call to restructure society. Um, and I thought Rick's response, off, like again, still, not the fanboy please. here, but his response was profound because for all the good that did in fact come out of the Russian revolution, they reproduced the worst elements of the economics uh, and social production. That's why decolonizing economics, look, and, and I'm gonna take this uh, head on. Somebody in the chat, chat asked, well, what is capitalism? Because a lot of folks act like it's so hard to understand, and that's BS. Let me give you what every, like from Milton Friedman to Karl Marx and everybody in between, here's the basic definition, at least of industrial capitalism. Five characteristics, and it's actually quite easy. Number one, the private ownership of the means of production privatization of the decision-making authority. And by means of production, we mean the farms, we need the ranches, we need the factories, all the things that produce the things that we need to consume, you know, good old fashioned use value, one, privately owned. Number two, that those uh, things are produced uh, as commodities to be bought and paid for right, as opposed to just need and use. So the difference between use value and surplus value. Number So one, the private ownership of the means of production. Uh, number two, that goods and services are produced as commodities to be bought and paid for, which brings us to characteristic three, profit. Everything is assumed uh, to be done only for profit and profit maximization underscores everything. Number four, and both Yvonne and Kali uh, mentioned this in their opening remarks, that labor itself is just one more commodity that's bought and paid for. I argue that labor or work is something noble and profoundly different. It's not just a thing. It is human endeavor, right? Uh, and done properly, the endeavor of creating the society that we want is actually sacred work. The fifth thing, markets. The whole shebang is actually facilitated by markets. So those five characteristics are the definition of capitalism itself. So what is to be done? I argue capitalism taken together, it is the ideology of the cancer cell. It literally motivates and incentivizes the destruction of Mother Earth faster than she can replenish herself. And I'll end with this, since you asked me, Jess. Uh, I'm, I'm acting like a panelist now, and I apologize, but I couldn't help myself. But the point is this, you put all of that together, like taken alone, any one of those characteristics, we've been ingrained to think, well, yeah, okay, that makes sense, that makes sense. Except when you take one step back from the tapestry, think about the implications, it's literally destroying the planet. It is literally the ideology of cancer. And we're lifting it up. And if we don't interrupt it and restructure how our social and economic production works, social and economic relations, we're going to destroy this planet. So that's, that's why I actually chose the prompt, what is to be done. Th thank you, David. Um, you know, one thing that I, I wanted to, this made me think of, um, and I sort of wanted to, to touch upon a question that Rick brought up 
um, in his opening remarks, and I think um, I think Jessica spoke to as well. Like capitalism is, I, I mean, there's the trope that it's natural, that um, it's just sort of the status quo. It's just the assumption. This is the world that we have to live in. There's this beautiful quote by Ursula Le Guin. Um, someone tell me what it is. It's something about like you know, capital. We we think that capitalism is natural um, and necessary, but so did we. So we thought were the divine right of kings, and you know, we see we saw where that went. Um, so so you know, I appreciate that, and I appreciate also, you know, the question of what can we learn from from our indigenous comrades, you know. Um, like, so when, um, Jessica, when you were talking about the book that you're reading, I was like looking on my bookshelf for the book that I have still yet to wade through, but a book called The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengro, um, which is a telling of a different version of the history other than the one that's typically told that, you know, our human, you know, sort of civilization sort of advanced in this theological trajectory where we went from, you know, relatively egalitarian hunter gatherer communities to then, you know, an authoritarian state that had to, you know, organize in a centralized manner in order to organize resources for agriculture and for irrigation. Um, and they said, no, there's actually, you know, there's not that sort of teleology. There's a lot of examples of folks that went into agriculture and then went back, you know, and and so I don't know. So I think that there's so I think I think even historically within the record, there's there's instances where capitalism is not natural. Like it it is not the only choice that we have. We have other choices. We can look towards history and we look, we can look towards examples um, you know, in other sort of social formations as well. It might also help to remind people that in the heyday of slavery and feudalism, there were lots of people who thought those were the natural, only, perpetual, forever systems. Uh, there's a tendency for folks, particularly when systems start to, sh to shake and to begin to disintegrate, one way to hold on to something falling apart is to pretend that it can't possibly because things have always been this way. It's a comfort, but it is a delusion. And, and there's no reason to imagine that capitalism is the end of history uh, and that nothing will continue to change because we do know one thing, every other economic system of which we have any record in the history of the world was born, evolved over time and died and passed away and was replaced by something else. And the burden is not on us to suggest that that's true for capitalism. The burden would be on anyone who thinks it isn't, uh, given that the history. And, and the nice corollary of that is, we know that capitalism has already been born and we know that it has evolved, which means the next stage of this system is to die. It's not a question of whether, it's just a question of when. And, and if I, you know, I think Jessica, something that you mentioned in your, in your talk was, who are we going to become when we create a new system? Um, I love that question. And I, I'd love to dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, um, I guess the way that I think about it um, is as a mom, honestly, um, I'm raising a child <laughs> in this extremely chaotic and concerning world. I am actively invested in, you know, the rebellion, the revolution, folks who believe that another world is possible, that we are building it, and that our relationships mean everything. And I, I got a really wonderful question um, sent to me in the chat um, from Chiara, um, basically asking for folks who've had the benefit of going through 
institutions of higher learning going through university systems where we can acquire um, knowledge, right? There's the accumulation of knowledge, university systems, um, you know, I hail from the UC system, are sites of production of knowledge, or at least how they're, that's how they're seen. And I think um, I carry a lot of frustration around universities, but some of my earliest memories were being raised on the UC San Diego campus because my father was a non-traditional student. Um, he was told by his like high school counselors that he would not succeed. He should be a carpenter, you know, shitting on trade kind of jobs. And my father went on to, you know, pursue medical school and all of that, but he also had a strong orientation around history and what history was not being told. Um, so he's a Chicano scholar, had the benefit of support from folks who have gone through STEM programs, um, carrying that identity and kind of walking between different worlds. Um, so I was raised with an, an awareness, acknowledgement of indigenous heritage, uh, but definitely raised outside of the culture. I have been assimilated into this capitalist culture, but was also raised with stories about it wasn't always like this and there being a lot of pain around that. So I think in terms of who are we going to become, I think we need to be much more agile and adept at our emotional intelligence. And I see that as kind of this running parallel with artificial intelligence that's being invested in and escalated right now. So we need to really up the ante on our relational, our spatial, our spiritual. And I think that's where our politics can be ruptured and unsettled. And I think that's one of the, the core messages around decolonization is unsettling. We are not going to be able to perfectly predict these answers, but we have to have some level of faith and trust in the, the power of healing. Um, and what that means and what that looks like exactly, well, there's beautiful examples popping up, but it's open. It's an open space. And I think that's scary to these powers that be. They don't know how to operate on that terrain. So they do whatever they can to limit it, to stifle it, to not talk about it. And so we got to be louder and more out there than ever, more authentically ourselves. So that would be my kind of reflection on that. I'm gonna actually jump in and say, uh, Yvonne, you posed the, uh, or repeated the question, just answered it. I'm gonna literally say, Yvonne, Kali, and Rick in that order. Like that question of what is it that we want to become, that seems profound. I'm gonna ask each of you to reflect on that. What's the order you um, want us to go again? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, but go, go on, Yvonne. Oh, I mean, I, I'm actually happy to to have someone else go in front of me because I'm still thinking about the answer. <laughs> Hit it, Kali. Then we'll go Kali, Rick, and Ivan because I put y'all on the spot. Um, what we will become, right? Um, I think we'll become many different things. Like, I don't think there's like one thing. Um, now, I think there'll be um, kind of a generalized um, framework of, re of like regenerative practices around economics that we kind of evolve into, right? Which will combine us to work within the, the the ecological limits, you know, of our home. Like I think that's a, a piece of of uh, what we're going to have to to evolve into. But um, you know, at least in in what is known as recorded history, you know, we we haven't had examples of uh, societies that don't have hierarchies, right? Um, we don't have examples of, of societies that don't other people for not speaking their uh, language um, or sharing in their uh, culture. That don't mean all of them were in conflict, but you know, there were clear distinctions between like in-group and out-group, uh, sometimes for defensive purposes, some, sometimes just because we don't understand each other, right? Uh, but uh, I think there's a balance that we could uh, achieve wherein we could we could wind up having and creating time and space 
say for each of us to learn 10 different languages. Imagine how profoundly different we would be, you know, just as a species if we could do that, right? Um, if we had all the, the, the you know, time and, and leisure uh, to study mathematics, to study physics, to study the arts, you know, uh, what types of, you know, uh, functional, you know, human-centered uh, kind of tools that we could create that aren't just about, let me produce this because it enables me to extract more from the earth or transform, you know, things into to commodities. Um, you know, it could be profoundly different. You know, um, I know to some this might be, you know, considered a nightmare, but, you know, you can imagine a society where gender doesn't play uh, a determinative role uh, uh, in the future uh, because of the different things that uh, science has already pointed us to that could be possible about how even reproduction itself could take place. And I'm not talking about babies and test tubes and all that. Don't get so folks are clear. Uh, I'm not an advocate for that kind of a, a cloning society that you saw in the super the latest Superman movie. But you know, there's profoundly different ways, um, you know, in which we could do the care work and the reproductive work that is already kind of available, but it's available at a cost, right? And that those the the, the, the things that are currently considered benefits are only to those who can like really afford them. Well, imagine if we were able to kind of universalize that and give people a real choice about who they want to be and how they want to be and you know where they want to go. Right, so it would be, I, we don't, we can't limit our imaginations to, to like just eliminating poverty, right? Or just eliminating like, like a, a racism. I think those are stepping stones, but I would argue comrades like, like there's far more that we could get to and ascribe to if we allow ourselves to like truly imagine and envision beyond just the immediate scope of the things that we've been confined within these last couple of hundred years. Well, I would just like to pick up on the thing I said before, because it always gets me kind of angry. Uh, I, I'm a product of uh, the elite schools of the United States. So they did try to train me to be a good capitalist. Uh, most of my classmates ended up in that position. Um, and I've always resented it. Because I've thought that what, what the capitalist system does, like slavery and like feudalism, is give a fairly broad-based, kind of open, pretty sensitive education uh, and set of opportunities to 10% of the people at the most, at the cost of drudgery, boredom, repetition, narrowness, and limitless, limited opportunities for the 90% and then justifies what it's doing by pointing out that 10% of the people are better educated than the others, as if the system responded to the way people are rather than the way people are is a result of the way the system is set up. Uh, I find that so outrageous that it sometimes ends me up and you know, I depend on my mouth for my job, but I, mean, I, I get tongue tied because it, it is so evil. And for me, one of the reasons I'm, a, I'm an advocate for worker co-ops is I'm convinced that if the workplace drew on everybody to participate democratically, not just in the drudge work, but in the design, in the running, in the evaluation, and everything else, then the decisions made in every workplace would not only be better because more people are in it, but the people themselves would be much more rounded in their development, much more likely if they're participant in the workplace democratically to demand that really in the political sphere as well. So I have a sense of rounded, developed people as the alternative. And for me, Capitalism is awful, among other reasons, because it holds back 
so many people from the things they could and would and should have done in their lives. And most people kind of know it. If, we, if there were a left that put it out there on the table, I think it would have an echo in people's own secret hearts about what they didn't do in their lives and wish they could have done, which if circumstances had been different would have been possible. Capitalism should be seen for the constriction and the limit of what it does. And the alternative is a freedom. We, and Kali's right, we can't be detailed about exactly how that's going to look. But the notion of a freedom, you know, in slavery, the, the slaves didn't know exactly what freedom would mean. But they knew they wanted that. They knew they had to get out of what they were in. They knew it was crippling them what they were in. I think we, that's okay. You don't have to know the blueprint for the future. It's enough to be clear that what we got, we can do better than, and let's go for it. Yeah. Um, I agree with so much of what um, everyone has said before about what is, what, is, what is subjectivity under a new system. And I would also say that I think we carry seeds of a new system within us. I think that, um, you know, just like it's not natural for capitalism to be the dominant way of organizing our economy, um, I don't, I think that um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference of opinion over how humans are constituted and how we relate to each other. So there was a Russian um, anarchist philosopher, Peter Kropotkin, that came up with this concept of mutual aid. The idea that, you know, we don't, you know, as, as species, as, 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 you know, different animal species, humans, we don't survive because we're like selfish economic actors only acting for ourselves and out of our own self-interest, but we survive because we cooperate, because we help each other. Um, we, you know, like trees, like, you know, we, we, they, in a forest, it's been found that when, um, in a, there's a lot of communication happening between trees and, and their roots. And when there's a tree that's ailing, the other trees will send nutrients its way. Like, that's just the way that, you know, we have survived. And I think that's, those are the, those are the seeds. It's, it's that sort of basis that, that instinct for, for cooperation, for mutual aid, that is going to be the seeds of how we are and how we are with each other in a new society. And, and I would just say like, um, I've done some, I know my mentor, Jessica Gordon Nebhart has done a lot of research on, and she's written a book called Collective Courage about how, you know, sort of this, in, this, this impulse for cooperation and mutual aid has existed in African-American communities um, and um, is an early history of a cooperative economics. And I've done some of that like digging into for Asian American communities and found that in immigrant communities um, here in the United States, different Asian American groups have also cooperated through creating mutual aid societies, um, through creating lending circles, you know, through um, just different ways of pooling together their resources, especially since the history of Asian Americans has been linked to the history of the Exclusion Act and the alien land law. So, um, but, but these things that we do when we're, you know, um, um, subjected to laws of exclusion are also um, things that can help us thrive in a new society. So I said I would lightly facilitate, and I'm trying to get comfortable with silence, but on a webinar, it makes it hard. So, uh, Kali, I'm going to turn to you because, you know, you and I have had some conversations around Kropotkin, and uh, it, it just feels like Yvonne has literally invited this sort of conversation around, uh, are we, in fact, uh, trying to operationalize a kind of anarcho-communism or, uh, or, 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 or our version of it? Like, are these are these actually liberated zones that we're that we're moving towards? 
we should be moving towards that. Yes, uh, in my view. I mean, that's the argument position that I would, would hold. Uh, but I think we have to recognize and, and be clear about what that will mean, right? Like, um, it will mean challenging, in many respects, the central authority of the United States government. Um, that ain't easy to do, right? Uh, and it will come with, with some uh, repercussions that uh, we need to be uh, clear about amongst ourselves. And, and I think in our organizing work, be clear uh, in how we present it and how we frame that uh, to the folks that we're trying to be in some relation with um, so that folks' choices are, are clear, right? So um, I think as many of you know, you know, part of our uh, uh, kind of historical framework um, with like the Jackson Cush and it comes out of the new African independence movement, right? Which has been uh, fighting for uh, self-determination and, and sovereignty, you know, for uh, people of African descent, you know, uh, which we call new Africans, uh, basically. Um, uh, and that meant, you know, deconstructing and destroying the authority of the United States government, like over, over these lands. Uh, but in the context uh, you know, that respected, uplifted, and, and, and would try to restore uh, as we understood it, because it's not, that couldn't be just a one-way street, um, you know, indigenous uh, uh, sovereignty and claims uh, there, which, you know, our, our piece never tried to um, subvert or overtake or reproduce the, the colonial dynamics that we've all been subject to uh, being a part of this settler colonial project. Um, but you know, we I'm bringing this up because it's one of the things when we've argued or raised a, a, at different times the slogan, uh, you know, like uh, uh, free the land, we want people to really understand what that means, right? Uh, and, and what it would entail. Uh, and, and so that people were very clear about the choices uh, that our movement was po posing, right? So that they can either support it or say, hey, that's not what I, that I accept. Uh, or I don't think that's feasible. I don't think that's sound. I don't think it's safe. Um, because, you know, it's in raising these questions and posing these challenges. That's where the de real democratic practice comes from. Because we don't want to be involved in, you know, we want to be involved and have to be involved in like the class struggle, the struggle for, for uh, self-determination against oppressive forces. But we don't want to be imposing upon folks, right? Every, every step and every choice you know, should be an option, right? The democratic principle needs to be upheld. So that that is a piece um, that is a deep part of, I think, the learning uh, that we all have to kind of, I think, ascribe to towards building these liberated zones, right? Because we don't want to build reactionary camps, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, within the zone of folks who are kind of uh, working to undermine it because people feel like uh, uh, they've been left behind or not discarded or not heard from. Uh, so there's a deeper piece of um, winning folks over, for lack of a better term, you know, to, I think, an expansive view of what the society and what the world could look like and what role we all play in having to construct that. And that's not going to be easy. I mean, trust me, that is not going to be easy. You know, as, as uh, Rick talked about, uh, you know, moving in some ways, moving some aspects at different points in time shifting some things in, you know, the, the basic mechanics around the economy or uh, uh, even sometimes, you know, shifting quote unquote ownership of land, that can be sometimes much easier than deconstructing the, the colonized portions of our mind, right? Like uh, thinking that certain gender roles, for instance, are, are natural or normal or, you know, ordained by God or something like that, that these things have to be that way. Like that's a part of another, you know, iteration of, of colonization that we all have to struggle to, to, to undo. Uh, and that's not going to be easy. You know, uh, if it was easy, it would have been done already. You know, but these are things that took centuries to, to build. Uh, they were, they were uh, none of this was done naturally, right? All of this was done because it was forced upon us, literally forced upon us. Um, you know, there's a couple of good books, I think that really, Against the Grain, I think is one I would recommend people uh, reading. Uh, uh, I haven't finished reading uh, was a Graeber's book yet, but there's some good pieces of that. I think they talked about, you know, looking at history from some different uh, uh, lenses that speak to part of what Yvonne was talking about 
um, that like how we got to these particular uh, places uh, was through different kind of class orders, different hierarchies imposing upon themselves to meet certain needs and, and specifics. And with that came logics and, and justifications um, that sometimes then got transferred and codified to, to the rest of us as this is this is the natural order or this is our uh, kind of culture and we have to work to undo that so there's some there's a lot of work you know that's still going to have to be done um and this is why i think we say revolution is a process if we're being honest with ourselves right it, you know like we could in the old school way you know thinking about the liberation movements of africa or latin america or you know most of them the 20th century that you know uh we kind of like capture the state and you know now we have you know uh control of the reins then we do the same things that were that were some of the exact same things that were done before uh um you know because you know that that was the example we had uh uh in our minds to to begin with because we didn't quite undo that work and i think i i would encourage anybody who came in late or anybody who's gonna watch this to go back and listen i think to, to rick's piece particularly about how that kind of played out in the, in the Soviet experiment, right? That's not one that, that, in my view, that we should shy away or be ashamed of. We got to learn from it, the good and the bad, right? Uh, uh, some profound lessons there, right? Uh, started in earnest, but I think there were some, you know, uh, we, we now have, I think, the benefit of having that experience. People, most people want to shy away from it. We now have the benefit of like, hey, you know, uh, uh, valiant effort, ran into some, 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 some challenges, has some internal challenges, has some logic challenges, you know, let's, let's learn from this and not repeat these mistakes. Thank you, Kali. Y'all, this 90 minutes just flew by. Uh, I, I do want to respect the time, so I'm going to, in the same order, Ivan, Rick, Jessica, then Kali, to invite you to some closing words, and then I'll kick it to Nikola for, uh, who uh, is my, the key co-organizer here, to talk about the next session. So. Yvonne, Rick, Jessica, Kali. Wow, there's so much that was covered. <laughs> it's sort of hard to kind of have final thoughts, but it, it does seem like we've all spoken to the fact that capitalism is not natural. It's just, it's just you know, sort of commonsensical. It's, it's assumed that it's the only way, but it, it is clearly not. There are other forms. I think worker co-ops are one way in which we can do things differently and organize production and and labor differently um i would love to us i would love all of us to build strong cities strong municipalist projects in our places and to confederate them together um, and i just want to invite everyone to um, come to our learning series on may day um, you can sign up at municipal municipalism.org um, and we will continue these conversations together. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> let me close by telling you where I think we are. Um, I think that the center of capitalism's dynamism is replicating what happened at the end of feudalism. Feudalism was a system in Europe for a thousand years from the end of Rome to about the 16th century. It started out very decentralized, but the struggle between the serfs and the lords got out of hand and the lords had to create governments with enormous powers to keep a control over those serfs. And it ended up in what used to be called the absolute states. You may remember from your history, Louis the 14th in France and the kings of England and all of that. And they ended up literally destroying themselves and feudalism in the process. Out of that ruins in Europe came capitalism. It started off very decentralized, very small in this city, in that town, in this region, before it became a dominant system and as the difficulties of capitalism got worse, it too turned to more and more powerful, big units with massive armies. Think Napoleon for the end of feudalism and think the United States for now. 
Not only has this happened, but the world is now divided into three or four monstrous capitalist empires. Capitalist because employer-employee remains the relationship that dominates in production. The dynamic center of capitalism has moved. Americans are having a terrible hard time facing this. It's not here anymore. It's not in Western Europe and it's not in Japan. It's in China and India and places like that. And that struggle is over. The winner is clear and the United States isn't it. And the desperation that comes from that can be seen in the hysteria over a footnote to that process, which is Ukraine. That is an empire. Russia wanted to rebuild what it lost after 1989. The United States wanted to grab a little more, got most of what Russia had in Eastern Europe, meanwhile losing the rest of the world and being shaky about how to proceed here. We're watching a, a disintegration that happens when you peek it up into these monstrous giants blowing each other out of the water. It's exactly what happened at the end of feudalism. And we're repeating it now. And we ought to be thinking and talking because no one in this culture dares to do it. They, do, they talk about bits and pieces, but putting it together as a social system whose time has come to go is what we can do because we have it now in our position and on our, within our hands to be explaining to all the different communities we're trying to reach that there really is a basis for us all to get together, to get through this awful period without being destroyed by it. I want to thank uh, David. I want to thank um, Cal Poly Humboldt. I want to thank the We Out Tribe, um, Dr. Richard Wolf, Callie, Yvonne. It was a pleasure to share space with you all. And as was named, I think there are amazing conversations that can continue beyond the space of this panel. Um, I look forward to connecting with folks. I'm going to go ahead and put a link to our upcoming R4 workshop series session, which will be happening tonight at 5 p.m. Pacific. We're going to be looking through the theme of repair and talking about things like repairing our relationship to the land, to each other, reparations, land back, and how we can get active in that work now. Um, and another thing that really stuck with me that Callie named, we are doing a lot of work. It's how we're putting it all together that matters and requires a lot of care and consideration. So to that end, I hope we get it together. And I really appreciate you all. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being a part of this incredible presentation. We appreciate all of your time. It was incredibly impactful for all of our participants. And we thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us all. Just want to highlight that our upcoming session is contesting for power for a people's economy that starts at one o'clock till 2.30. I just want to remind all of our participants that if you've been with us since our 9 a.m. Pacific time session, take care of yourselves between these sessions. Make sure you stretch, get some water, take care. Um, this is going to be a long three days and we're so grateful to have you all on this journey with us. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer, save the chat. We'll see you all in the next session and thank you again. Yeah.